October 2019 was a major moment in space history, the first all-woman spacewalk. But as you might have heard, this milestone was originally scheduled six months earlier. The problem? They only had one medium-sized torso piece prepped for use. Have you ever worn a coat or a pair of gloves that were just a little too big? It makes it really hard to move around. And in space, the right fit isn't just about comfort, but about survival. Just ask retired astronaut Katie Coleman. The spacesuit is actually a difficult thing for all of us, and this is actually your very own personal spaceship in the shape of a human, right? I mean, it, because it needs to supply your oxygen and scrubbing out the CO2, you're controlling the heat in your body, and it is your barrier between you and the blackness and the vacuum of space. So it's an extremely sophisticated spaceship and it's not easy to say, let's just design a new one. The older ones were designed with guys in mind. But spacesuits weren't the only thing designed primarily for men. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Space for Humans. I'm Eric Stribling, assistant teaching professor in the Arizona State University Interplanetary Initiative, and I'll be your guide as we explore ethical and inclusive design in space. In this episode, we'll dive into how NASA redesigned the toilet for the Artemis II mission and what that process can teach us about engineering inclusive extraterrestrial cities. Which brings us to Artemis II. Set to launch in late 2025, Artemis II aims to send four astronauts on a flyby of the moon, farther into space than humanity has ever traveled. But what's really exciting about Artemis II is that it's essentially a test mission, investigating and assessing all of the equipment in preparation for Artemis III, which will land the first ever woman on the moon. And that's where the toilet comes in. The standard space toilet was designed to work well for people who stood up to pee and sat down to poop, but not at the same time. This proved a problem in particular for women astronauts. So why didn't the engineers who designed the toilet consider them? To answer that question, we have to talk about Reference Man. In law school, you might know him as Reasonably Prudent Man. In film, he's the invisible norm. Reference Man is typically a white, cisgender man, 25 to 30, clocking in at about 5'11", 170 pounds, maybe has strong opinions on IPAs, and the air raid offense system. Sometimes he skips leg day. I did skip leg day. You get the idea. There's been a tendency to design the technologies of our world to meet reference man's needs. And this shows up across industries, from construction to medicine to voice recognition. Piano keys are designed for larger hands, making certain chords challenging for many women. Health and safety masks are made for larger faces, potentially exposing slighter builds to more toxins and germs. For almost 50 years, crash test dummies were based entirely on Reference Man until a 2011 study found that women drivers had a 47% higher likelihood of serious injury in an accident. And it's easy to see how Reference Man came to be. Today, the United States engineering workforce is made up of about 86% men. But that figure was closer to 100% in the 1960s, the early days of space exploration. Reference Man's legacy has created a lot of design gaps, both on Earth and in space. Think about why the canceled spacewalk was such a big deal. What promised to be a historic moment for women in space was delayed due to valid safety concerns, but for some, it echoed a pattern of both design and policies that disproportionately ignored the needs of women. And spacesuits were a sore point. In the 1990s, NASA discontinued the extra small and small sizes to cut costs. And that choice affected about one third of women astronauts who didn't fit the medium or large sizes. Remember that the purpose of the Artemis II mission is to test the equipment that will eventually transport and land the first woman on the moon. Now let's extend that idea forward to the ultimate goal, 
human exploration, and eventual habitation of the moon and other planets. And if we want to build space cities, we're going to have to start doing a better job of engineering design for all of humanity, not just reference man. To tell us more about what factors we should consider when designing these space cities is PhD candidate Farah Nahar Aravalo from Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation and Society, whose research interests center around feminist design of urban spaces. Cities are constructed across physical space, but they are also constructed on top of the past. And in the past, cities were designed and built by men. They reflected the historical tradition of separate spheres. Women were socially located in the private space, the home, while men were the ones in public life, the city. These social norms have shifted significantly, but we still see their imprint on present-day urban design where women have often been treated as an afterthought. For example, public restrooms. Women may need the restroom more frequently and require more time than men. However, public bathrooms are usually spaced far apart and their size is based more on the number of urinals than stalls. Traditional public bathrooms design also fails today's men who have taken on a greater role in childcare. Yet, where do we find baby changing tables? Often, only in the women's bathroom. And these examples don't even begin to capture how little urban design has considered the experiences of trans and non-binary people. So what does this mean for space cities? Well, you might think it would be easy to avoid the mistakes of the past in designing a city from scratch. But let me introduce you to the city of Brasilia, which replaced Rio de Janeiro as the capital of Brazil in 1960. Brasilia was a brand new modern city built to avert many of the societal ills that plagued other Brazilian cities such as gentrification, loss of urban vegetation, and lack of public spaces. It was designed to be a modern utopia. Sounds perfect, right? Unfortunately, Brasilia ended up generating the same, if not worse, conditions. The focus on modernity produced a car-centric city where the prestige of the city took precedence over the everyday experiences of people living there. It's hard to anticipate the needs of future residents of a city, and those needs become even more complicated in space. What does it mean to play in space? Can we raise children in a space city? How do we foster community and support mental health? Space also includes unique ecological and structural challenges. Given the inhospitable climate, our space cities will need to be almost perfectly sustainable. Most of our terrestrial city models are extractive. But what would we do with our waste in space? And that brings us back to the Artemis II toilet. Women make up an increasing share of NASA's astronaut corps, and they need a better space toilet. So what did NASA do? an ergonomic redesign from the bottom up. And hey, just in case you wanted to know, this is what the new space toilets look like. There's like some foot straps, a little shoulder lever, not very comfortable, but hey, practical? The new Artemis II space toilet improves both form and function, allowing astronauts to more easily strap in and clean up. And unlike older models, it permits simultaneous use of both the urine funnel and the toilet seat, allowing every user to boldly go both poop and pee at the same time. As far as example of Brasilia illustrates, even brand new designs can be hindered by old problems. The solution to this isn't just found in small structural changes, but in a new type of design thinking that better includes all bodies and intersectional identities. Designing space technology successfully will mean having interdisciplinary groups of experts alongside people with diverse life experiences, and their voices need to be constantly considered throughout the entire design process. And that's exactly how NASA redesigned the Artemis II toilet, by listening to women astronauts. And we make design more inclusive by including more people in the conversation. As Farah said, that can be hard work. But remember, it's not rocket science. Thank you for watching. 
Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. To find out more, visit interplanetary.asu.edu. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah, high school. I was part of a, it's called a clown alley. I actually think that I was very uh, socially like awkward and reserved as a kid. And like I, most of my social skills are just clowning techniques that I've adapted for human interaction. All right.